Uh, welcome to the online uh, causal inference seminar. Today, we're very lucky to have uh, Andrea Rotnitsky from Ditele University in Buenos Aires. Uh, she's going to talk about optimal adjustment sets and non-parametric graphical models. Uh, we're also lucky to have a discussion by uh, Emma Perkovich from the University of Washington, which will occur after the talk. Um, if you have any uh, questions, please submit them through Q&A. Um, and if you want to contact the uh, panelists, please uh, submit the, uh, your concerns in the chat. Uh, we also are joined in Q&A by Facundo Sapienza. Um, Guillaume will be uh, uh, handling questions today, so uh, I'll switch over to Guillaume now. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I Michael, I Michael mentioned um, we uh, are lucky to have Facundo um, to help us with the Q&A. So uh, submit your questions there. Facundo will uh, do his best to answer them. Um, we will also select a few questions to ask to um, uh, Andrea. Uh, so um, if your question is selected, I will reach out to you and um, ask you to raise your hand. So please do not raise your hand unless I've asked you to do so. All right, that's it uh, from me. Andrea, feel free to start whenever you're ready. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, Michael, Guillermo, uh, and Emma for joining us in the discussion. Uh, so um, I'm very um, lucky to be here uh, to present our work. Uh, the work that I will be presenting is work that we've done with Ezekiel Smukler, who is now uh, in Barcelona at Globo, and uh, Facundo, who is here, and he's uh, at UC Berkeley. And it's based on two papers. Uh, the first one that uh, appeared in 2020 in the Journal of Machine Learning Research and the other one that is about to appear in Biometrica. Uh, it's already available online. So here is the problem that I want to address today. Andrea? So, yes. Uh, yes. So currently you're not full screen. Is that, is that oh, what you okay. intend? Oh, no, no, that's, that's a problem. Thank you very much. Let me see. And I also, I guess I also want to, let's see. I want to also, Connect this. Is this better? Yes. Any okay. better? Yeah, that looks, that looks great. good. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So, suppose that we want to design, we are at the stage of designing a plan observational study, and the objective of the study is to investigate the population average effect, treatment effect of a point exposure or treatment on an outcome. Now, the treatment that I will be considering could be uh, static, meaning one size fits all, or personalized, where um, um, the treatment uh, depends on covariates. The treatment that I am planning to assign in an intervene world will depend on covariates. Now, uh, suppose that in order to decide which variables to measure, uh, in order to control for confounding, with the input of experts, uh, we postulate a causal graphical model. Now, at the design stage, we must also specify the anticipated strategy of analysis. So suppose that we anticipate estimating causal effects by non-parametric adjustment, meaning, as I will formalize later, that we will estimate the population average treatment effect by either IPW or outcome regression or W robust estimation, estimating uh, the nuisance functions, the propensity score and or the outcome regression uh, non-parametrically using any non-parametric or machine learning technique. Now, in many graphs, we will find that there are several distinct sets of covariates that will suffice to control for um, confounding by the anticipated method of analysis, meaning uh, um, the method of adjustment. So the question is, which variables should we measure? In this talk, I will address this question from the perspective of solving the problem of determining among adjustment sets that suffice uh, to control for confounding, the one that yields the non-parametrically adjusted estimation of population average, estimator of population average treatment effect with smallest asymptotic variance. Now, because estimation of conditional mean functions and propensity scores scales up in difficulty with the number of covariates, we may also want to consider restricting attention to the set of minimal adjustment sets. These are adjustment sets such that removal of one variable from the sets invalidates the, set, the remaining set as an adjustment set. We no longer are able to control for confounding. 
even more uh, and along the same lines, we may also want to restrict attention to the smallest size adjustment sets, which are a subset of the minimal adjustment sets conformed by, comprised by those uh, adjustment sets that have the minimum possible cardinality. Now, um, along the same lines and being realistic, uh, not all variables uh, that we postulate in a graphical model, in a causal graphical model may be observable. Some will be impossible to measure for logistics or cost considerations. So it may happen that uh, among the variables that are observable, we, are, we still have variables that suffice as uh, adjustment sets that suffice to control for confounding. Then the question is, uh, among those variables that are observable uh, and are uh, adjustment sets, which are, is the set that again minimizes uh, the variance of the non-parametrically adjusted uh, uh, um, estimate. Okay, so uh, the plan here is that I will illustrate the topic first, kind of informally, with a number of examples, with the aim of warming up a little bit. Then I will go through the uh, background that will allow me to uh, uh, formalize the problem uh, sufficiently well so that everything that I will say, the results that I will give uh, later on will make sense. And then finally, I will talk about uh, results. I will focus primarily uh, on adjustment sets in uh, graphs without hidden variables, not because we don't have results for hidden variables, but because the, the, um, the solution scales up in complication and uh, I don't think I will have time. If I do, I will uh, talk about it. And lastly, if I have time, I will talk a little bit as well about semi-parametric efficient estimation meaning if we could hope to measure all the variables in the graph, then uh, how will we do it efficiently, okay? And then finally, I will uh, end with a summary of uh, open issues and, and uh, questions. Okay, so here is an example of a graph taken um, from Shear and Platt. Uh, it was an expository paper uh, explaining precisely the usefulness of uh, causal graphical models to a medical audience. Um, and suppose that we want to estimate the effect of warming up exercises of different types of warm up exercises on uh, the occurrence of an injury during uh, while practicing sports. Well, in this graph, these two variables highlighted here suffice to control for confounding because they block all the backward, backward paths between uh, treatment and outcome. But likewise, these one do and the, and the, uh, and the union of both of them also do. So the question is, uh, if, if we consider all of them, I mean, there are many more that uh, are adjustment sets, which one uh, would give me the estimator with the smallest asymptotic variance? Um, so to be more precise about what estimators I'm talking about and how I'm planning to do the analysis, consider this very simple uh, model, okay? So here I'm interested in uh, treatment A on outcome Y, okay? And in this graph, Z alone and G alone or Z and G suffice to control for confounding, okay? And what I mean by that is uh, th they are actually valid adjustment sets. What I mean by that is that under the causal graphical model represented by this DAG, and I will be precise about that later on about what I mean by that, uh, the uh, mean in a world where I intervene and set the treatment A to a particular value little a, can be found, can be identified by the G formula, which can also uh, be re-expressed in IPW form. Now, the kind of estimators that I will be considering the, then for estimating the uh, mean will be estimators that estimate either the outcome regression conditional on the particular adjustment set or the um, propensity score and or both uh, in case of W robust estimators that are estimated uh, via some non-parametric technique, okay, or machine learning technique. And the question is of these three, if I have to choose which of these three to use to estimate this counterfactual mean, which one will yield the estimator with the smallest asymptotic variance? And the question is a valid question as, because as I will uh, formalize a little bit later, it turns out that all estimators of this functional that use non-parametric estimators 
of either the propensity uh, score or the conditional mean under sufficient uh, regularity conditions, smoothness conditions, or complexity com conditions uh, will converge to the same limiting distribution. So the question is, I need to compare essentially three asymptotic variances, okay? Because the three estimators will be root and consistent and asymptotically normal. And now I have to compare three variances, the variance associated with using G, the variance associated with using Z and the variance associated with using G and C. Okay, so now consider a case of a personalized treatment. Okay, so now we have again the same graph, but now suppose that I'm interested in estimating the mean in a world where I will only assign treatment A to those individuals that have covariate Z greater than a threshold value little z. Okay, so that's my personalized regime, my personalized treatment. And now the uh, adjustment sets that are available to me are two. One is Z and the other one is G and Z because I need to include Z in the adjustment set in order to calculate the counterfactual mean. So in fact, uh, what I mean now by adjustment set is again, that the counterfactual mean under the uh, assumptions of the causal graphical model uh, is expressed via the G formula or the IPW formula, where I now uh, replace the indicator as I had earlier with uh, the function uh, determining the regime. In the particular case that I am uh, discussing here, this particular example, the regime is deterministic. So this pi function here is a point mass probability, but if uh, I, everything that I will say will apply also to regimes that are uh, random regimes, where in the hypothetical world, I will be assigning treatment A equal one uh, with a certain probability uh, that depends on, uh, on the threshold Z. All right, so again, the question is, if I am to, ask, to estimate the propensity score and the outcome mean non-parametrically, which estimator will yield the smallest asymptotic variance? Now, uh, one, uh, to formalize what I mean by uh, minimum adjustment sets and minimal adjustment sets, consider this graph a little bit more complicated. Again, I'm interested in the effect of A and Y. And let's say that I'm interested in a static treatment regime. Well, here, uh, any, at any set of these uh, covariates in black that, includes, that it will include T will be a valid adjustment set. Likewise, if it includes R. And if it doesn't include R and T, there will still be covariates uh, adjustment sets that are valid. For example, one that includes M1 and M2, or one that includes H H1 and M2. In fact, anyone that includes at least one of M1 and H1 or M2 and H2 will be a valid adjustment set. But of all, all of the adjustment sets, there are certain adjustment sets for under which I cannot remove one variable without destroying the validity of the adjustment set. Those are the minimal adjustment sets. For example, H1 and H2 is a minimal adjustment set because if I remove one of these two variables from the set, I will open a backdoor path and I will uh, destroy, I will have uh, unmeasured compounding. Um, all right. Now I, I can also consider out of all the minimal adjustment sets, the one which have minimum cardinality, okay? Smallest cardinality. And those are the ones that I will call minimum adjustment sets. And the problems that I will address here are finding of the minimal or of the minimum adjustment sets, the one that yields the um, uh, estimator, uh, non-parametrically adjusted estimator with the smallest asymptotic variance. Right, so now let me turn um, to, uh, to the um, problem of formalizing briefly uh, exactly what I assume, uh, what I mean by uh, the causal graphical model uh, to define precisely what I mean by adjustment sets and non-parametric causal estimators. Okay, by a causal graphical model represented by a DAG, I mean uh, that the causal graphical, I, I mean that I am going to assume a causal graphical agnostic uh, model uh, that assumes that each vertex in the DAG stands for a factual random variable 
and that the joint law of the variables in the DAG factorizes according to the DAG. And by that, I mean that the joint distribution of the variables in this world uh, is a product of the conditional uh, probabilities of each node given its parents in the DAG. Right, but the proof of graphical model also assumes that the distribution of the data in a hypothetical world in which for a subset of the variables, say A1 is a AS, um, we implement a treatment regime in which we assign treatment AI to little AI with a certain probability pi i that depends on a set of covariates that are non-descendants of AI. Um, we obtain the formula uh, for uh, the joint distribution of the data in that world by the truncation formula, whereby we replace uh, the conditional distribution of the treatment given its parents in, in the um, actual law with uh, the distribution uh, that will hold in the intervene world. Now in this talk, for most of the talk, unless I have time at the very, very end, I will concentrate on a univariate. And the reason uh, that I will do that is because for a uh, multivariate state, when there are time dependent confounding, the problem is uh, scales up in difficulty. And in fact, the results are not so exciting because there are negative results about uh, about the existence of optimal adjustment sets. Um, so again, I will concentrate on A univariate, the point exposure. And throughout uh, my A will be a discrete treatment. It will be finite value. And I uh, will always assume that Z is a non-descendant of A. So I will not repeat myself. Z from now on is a non-descendant of A. All right. Uh, so let us now turn to the formal definition of what I mean by a Z adjustment set. Okay, a Z adjustment set is an adjustment set that will be valid, but that will help me, uh, that will lead me to uh, the um, to uh, estimation, to identification, when I want to identify a dynamic treatment regime that depends on a personalized regime that depends on Z. So uh, for such a uh, definition, then I need to require that Z is included in L. And secondly, that the, for, for any regime that depends on Z and any function of Y, uh, the mean of that function under the regime is found via uh, the uh, G functional, okay? The G functional again, that is computed um, using L, okay? Uh, if Z is the empty set, I will then say that L is a static adjustment set, okay, which is um, mostly uh, most of the papers uh, that I read on adjustment sets are about. Um, and uh, a non-parametric L adjusted estimator, as I said earlier, is any estimator of the G functional that estimates the unknown outcome mean or propensity score non-parametric. Okay, so um, there's uh, a lot of um, knowledge about uh, characterization of static adjustment sets. In fact, um, the uh, backdoor criterion of Perl, uh, the famous backdoor criterion of Perl, is give sufficient conditions uh, for uh, an adjustment set to be, um, for, for a set to be an adjustment set. Uh, a static adjustment set. The criterion is uh, sound but not complete, meaning that it gives sufficient conditions but not necessary. But then there is the generalized adjustment criterion uh, derived by Chipster and Markovic at all in, in a series of papers. And that, that is a, a complete and sound uh, criterion for determining uh, adjustment sets uh, for, the, for static regimes, okay? Uh, that is when Z uh, is the empty set. But in fact, it turns out that we can make good use of these results because the class of all Z adjustment sets we prove in one of our papers that it's actually comprised by a subset of the static adjustment sets, precisely the static adjustment sets that include L, that, that include Z, okay, that include the covariate that uh, our regime, that regimes that we care about depends on. So in fact, now uh, another fantastic uh, result, uh, which is uh, 
the existence of efficient uh, graphical algorithms for finding uh, all static adjustment sets, we can use that result to actually find the class of all uh, Z adjustment sets because this paper by um, Van der Sander, Lisquivitz, and Textor actually also includes all static, uh, also searches for all static adjustment sets that include a given set Z, okay? And it, it actually um, does it efficiently. Okay, uh, as for uh, the asymptotic variance of uh, the uh, non-parametrically adjusted estimators, um, recall that uh, Z is an adjustment set, uh, sorry, L is a Z adjustment set, if it satisfies that for any regime, uh, the counterfactual mean under the causal graphical model is the G functional, okay? And as I said, uh, the uh, estimators are those that estimate uh, the propensity score or the outcome regression non-parametrically. And the key point is that under sufficient regularity conditions on the complexity of uh, the nuisance functions or the smoothness of the nuisance functions, uh, all regular and asymptotically linear estimators, uh, basically you wish all asymptotic uh, estimators that are good and consistent will be um, asymptotically normal, will have uh, the same limiting um, mean zero normal distribution with a variance that now I can index based on uh, pi, the, the treatment regime, and L, okay? And L meaning the particular adjustment set that I chose. And of course, it will depend on P, okay? On the particular law at which I, I um, evaluate the calculation. Now, this variance here uh, is actually the variance of the unique influence function of the functional, the G functional uh, that adjusts for L under a non-parametric model. And there's a lot of knowledge that we all have um, been studying for many, many years about the structure, the geometric structure of this um, unique influence function. It's the, A, the augmented IPW um, estimating function, if you wish. Uh, that uh, we actually exploit it in order to understand uh, the, um, the um, ordering of, uh, or to understand the structure of the asymptotic variance uh, or the dependence of the asymptotic variance of, on L. Okay, so just to finalize the formalism of what I'm after, um, I will define then a globally optimal Z adjustment set, L global, uh, to a, um, an adjustment set such that for all regimes and all laws under the Bayesian network, the variance, the asymptotic variance that uses that particular adjustment set minimizes the uh, variance, the asymptotic variance over all possible Z adjustment sets. So that's what I call global. Then the observably, observable globally optimal adjustment set, Z adjustment set, will be the one that minimizes uh, these uh, variance, but now over observable adjustment sets, if such observable adjustment sets exist, of course. Um, the problem then actually is a minimization problem uh, where I now define a subset of variables, which I call the observable variables, let's call them N, and now the problem is minimize the variance subject not only to L being a C adjustment set, but also to L being included in the particular subset of observable variables N. Okay, and likewise, I'm not going to uh, reiterate, but I can do exactly the same, uh, I can give the same exact definitions, but now restricting attentions furthermore to minimal Z adjustment sets or to minimum Z adjustment sets. Okay, now let me um, uh, say that um, our work was really inspired. We started working on this problem after reading the fantastic paper by Henkel, Perkovic, and Mathwood uh, that actually provided graphical rules uh, for comparing certain pairs of static adjustment sets and for determining the optimal global static adjustment set. But um, in that paper, they um, used um, causal graphical linear models. That is, they further assume that, you know, that every 
every uh, variable in the dog was linearly related uh, to uh, the parents. And they estimated the treatment effect by ordinary squares adjusting by uh, the particular adjustment set. Um, of course, uh, their work and our work uh, is framed uh, into a long uh, history of uh, in, in classical statistic connected with the efficiency implications of include, inclusion of over adjustment and precision variables in regression. And that his, uh, uh, literature dates back at least to Cochrane in 1968. Okay, and our contributions include because uh, you know we, as I said, we go further in that we consider uh, adjustment sets that are minimal and minim uh, minimum, but also um, time dependent. Sorry, personalized and uh, and um, assuming also hidden variables, but they include uh, proving that the results at Kenkel, Berkovic, and Matthews also apply uh, in the case of um, graphical models that are non-parametric and where the treatment effect is estimated via non-parametric alcovariate adjustment. So I think that this is a good time uh, to stop um, and ask questions. Uh, I don't know if, uh, if there's any question or shall um, I continue? Yeah, so there was one, one, one question about uh, uh, clarifying. So th the question has been handled by Facundo, but I think it, it might be uh, helpful to, to clarify that. So uh, the question was, uh, about clarifying what you mean by all regimes uh, pi, and in particular, whether that denotes any possible treatment assignment given Z. And yes. kind of as a follow up it's question. Any, any possible treatment assignment given Z, that's correct. Okay. Meaning so, that it's for any regime, any absolutely. Remember how I, uh, I described one particular regime, a deterministic regime that uh, assigned treatment only if Z exceeded a, a particular threshold, but now you can change the threshold, and that's a new regime. Or you can toss a coin with a probability that depends on, you know, on on, a, on Z, and and you have now a different regime whether to assign or not, and and they are all they are all within that the class that I am considering, okay? Yeah. And I yeah. will. So in other words, I'm not thinking of which regime I'm going to be estimating when I when I do the calculation. Uh, the, the L that I will obtain will be valid for any regime. And, and if you consider if you consider a, a deterministic regime where th that actually doesn't depend on z, so a is assigned like a, it, right. That's a static the, the, the regime. The static case, yes. Yeah, um, that's a static so, case. That's when z is the empty set, and that's yeah. where that's that's uh that's what most of the literature uh, concentrates on. But if you so if you include Z in the in the adjustment set um, as you would do for the for the um, uh, the the non-static regime, then um, isn't there a risk that you might include a variable that you shouldn't actually include that basically no, breaks because, the no no because I'm including I'm including variables so first of all um, okay so so it's a good point but um, but, but you have to see that. Um, when I look at the class of Z adjustment sets, this result says that for a adjustment set to be a valid Z adjustment set, it has to be an, a static adjustment set. So what you're thinking is, I start with a static adjustment set and I add to a static adjustment set Z and that's wrong, okay? That's I not see. what I'm saying, okay? What I'm saying is you give me an, a static adjustment set, you check whether that uh, adjustment set includes Z, and then if it does, then it's a valid Z adjustment set, and not otherwise. Great, that, that makes clear? sense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, perfect, thank you. All right, um, okay, so, um, all right, so let me now uh, continue with um, now going to um, the formalization, okay? So our first result concerns supplementation of an existing adjustment set with precision variables. Now suppose that B is a Z adjustment set and that conditional on it, G is de-separated from treatment. That is under the, any factual law in the Bayesian network, G does not predict treatment. Then the result says that G union B is also a Z adjustment set and the asymptotic variance of the non-parametric estimators that use B union G 
uh, is less than or equal than that of the estimators that use B alone. In other words, adding G, a variable that does not further predict treatment, can never hurt. It can only help, but it can never hurt, okay? All right, because that variable G, of course, will be a variable that will um, actually, um, uh, at most, help me with uh, predicting Y, okay? And, and it doesn't create any over-adjustment. Okay, uh, now, in fact, um, the, uh, for the special case in which the regime is static and assigns A to little a, the formula for the amount of variance reduction is quite intuitive and revealing. Uh, it says that there is that there will be a large variance reduction when um, among those treated with A equal little a, within strata of the existing adjustment set B, the supplemental variables G are strong predictors of the outcomes for those variables of the existing adjustment set values, for those values of the existing ad adjustment set variable, sorry, for which there is a small chance of being assigned treatment. If you look at this here, I mean, yes, uh, G, when G is a good predictor of, of the outcome, this variance will be small, but it will matter most when G is a good predictor for those values of B for which B has a little chance at, for those values of B for which A has a little chance of being assigned to A. Because in those cases, this will be small, this will be large, and then there will be a great reduction in variance, okay? Now for B equal to the empty set, uh, in fact, this result, uh, we, um, Jamie and I um, in 1992 already uh, calculated this result uh, for, for B equal the empty set and Han later on in 1988 gave the same formula. And for that case, the formula quantifies the variance reduction associated with adjustment for pretreatment covariates in randomized studies. For static regimes, Henkel uh, et al. obtained uh, a similar quantitative result uh, for the asymptotic variance of OLS estimators under a causal linear graphical model. All right, uh, now let's consider the next one. The next one is about deleting or pruning variables from an adju existing adjustment set. That existing adjustment set, I will call it G union B, okay? And I will be contemplating uh, eliminating variables from that set that do not further predict the outcome, given the variables that will remain in the adjustment set, will, that will remain in the set and the treatment. Well, if I, if I delete variables that satisfy this condition, then it will turn out that if the remaining variables, that if I have not deleted the Zs from the set, then the uh, remaining variables will also be a Z adjustment set. And uh, it will again happen that the deletion will never hurt me. And in fact, typically it will help me. Meaning that for all pies, for all regimes and for all P's, it will be the case that the asymptotic variance by using just G will be better than using G union B. Okay, now, um, Again, uh, the formula for the case of a static regime that assigns A to little a is revealing. Uh, it says that the deletion will induce a large variance reduction when within levels of the remaining variables G, the variables B are strong predictors of treatment, especially for those levels of the remaining variables G for which among the treated, the outcome Y is harder to predict, meaning for those values of G for which uh, this variance, this conditional variance is large. So in other words, I mean, if I, if I have to, uh, roughly speaking, uh, say what this uh, formula is embodying, uh, the variance reduction induced by deletion of an over-adjustment variable B will be larger the stronger the association encoded in the green arrow is but the impact of the deletion will be more significant the weaker the association encoded in the blue edges. So that uh, the expectation, this expectation is larger and uh, the weaker the association encoded um, 
in the um, sorry, what did I say? The yeah. So if if the if the red uh, arrow is uh, encoding a weak association, then this um, this is going to be large, and that's when it will matter most. Okay, when the over adjustment, when deletion of the over adjustment variable will matter most. And the intuition for that is that if G predicts perfectly well Y, then it doesn't really matter whether you add B or not. Okay, so basically that's what, what this is saying. All right, so now uh, let's have a corollary, okay, that is immediate from these other two uh, results. The corollary says that, well, suppose that G and B are two Z adjustment sets and the part of G that is not in B does not help me to further predict A and the, the part of B that is not in G does not help me predict uh, Y given uh, G and, and the, the treatment. Then it's always, it, then for every law in the Bayesian network and all regimes, it's always the case uh, that uh, using G can never hurt. I mean, and typically helps, okay? And the, uh, the proof is really straightforward and, and rather uh, revealing because what we do is we just add and subtract uh, the uh, variance of using B union G, okay? And then we have uh, one part that is the gain due to supplementation with the precision component of G minus B. And then there is another part that is due to the gain due to the lesion of the noisy component of B minus G. And in this graph then, um, if I use this result, it will tell me that G is always better than B and, and it will be much, much better if G and cause a strong uh, association so that G is a good predictor of Y, but B is also very strong, okay? It goes a very strong antioxidants, okay? And the green line is weak, so that G is not too much associated with A. All right, uh, now not all adjustment sets are comparable. And this graph is, is just telling the whole story because in this graph, this graph is completely symmetric so there's no reason why, um, uh, you know, picking O1 and W2 as an adjustment set will be any better uh, across all laws than picking W1 and O2. And in fact, it will very much matter depending on the strength of, of the associations. And I will not go through that because um, it's, it's pretty clear. Uh, but the truth is that in fact, in spite of the fact that there is no adjustment set, no, that it's not true that all adjustment sets are comparable, uh, it is true that there is one adjustment set that is uh, more efficient than everyone, okay? It's, it's the best of all of them, and that's the O1, O2. It's the one intuitively that is closer to Y, okay? And to formalize this result, uh, actually, it's not me that I'm going to formalize, it's a result, uh, it's a graphical result, really, that uh, was derived uh, again in by Henkel, um, Berkovich, and Matthews, and it specifies the following. So here is uh, the guy that is going to be the winner, okay, O. So consider the set O, which is the set of non-descendants of A, and I'm writing it, you know, avoiding as much as possible, you know, terminology that is, um, you know, too technical, okay? So O is the set of non-descendants of A that are either parents of Y or parents of the vertices that are in the causal pathway between A and Y. Now, because they are non-descendants of A, they cannot be in the causal pathway, okay? But they are parents of Y or the vertices that are in the causal pathway between A and Y. Well, that set, Henkel et al. proved that is a static adjustment set and furthermore, that it satisfies these two conditions, okay? So that for any other static adjustment set, it verifies the two conditions that a good uh, adjustment set ought to satisfy. And therefore, uh, immediately it follows from uh, the corollaries that I mentioned earlier, that O is then the globally optimal static adjustment set. Okay, but that's just for static adjustment set. How about for adjustment sets that depend on personalized regimes that depend on Z. Well, in, uh, in the 2021 paper uh, with Facundo and Ezekiel, we proved that uh, O union Z is the optimally global, uh, optimal global Z adjustment set. 
So let me give you the example. So in this example, these three guys here are uh, determining the optimal adjustment set because they are parents of either uh, the uh, mediator in the causal pathway between treatment and outcome, or they are parents of the outcome, okay? And themselves, they are not descendants of treatment, okay? So this is the globally optimal adjustment set. It's the O set. And if I were to consider a treatment regime where I decide the type of warm-up exercise based on previous injury, the type of previous injury, then now uh, the optimal global adjustment set will also include a uh, previous injury. And this now is a, is a um, globally optimal adjustment set. Now, regarding Guillermo's uh, uh, point, uh, it is true that if you give me um, an adjustment set that is static, uh, it doesn't necessarily happen that when I add Z, I will remain, it will remain being a, a, an adjustment set. And you can see that because like, for example, with the M bias uh, uh, um, uh, graph, um, you know, the empty set is, is, uh, is, is an adjustment set, but if, I, uh, if my Z was exactly the point in the middle of the M bias, um, of course, when I add the Z, uh, I open a path and, and it's no longer, uh, you know, it's no longer an, an adjustment set. It doesn't block all the, Factor paths uh, between A and Y. But Andrea? with the optimal adjustment set, just one second, with the optimal sure. adjustment set, it is true. It is true that O union Z is an adjustment set. Okay, is 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 the optimal adjustment set. I mean it, it is an adjustment set. So even though it's not true for everything, O union Z is an adjustment set. I mean, if you add to O any non-descendant of Y, of A, sorry, if you add to O, if you Consider O, union any non-descendant of A, you obtain a static adjustment set. Therefore, now you have an adjustment set that is static and it includes Z, therefore is the uh, Z adjustment set. Okay, it's a Z adjustment set. Guillermo, did you have a, a point that you want I'm sorry. to- Sorry, I just wanted oh. to say you have about six minutes left. Oh my gosh, okay. okay. Well, then I have very little more to say. Okay, so let me then go to uh, optimal minimal adjustment set. Now included in the adjustment set, there may be many, several distinct minimal adjustment set. However, included in the globally optimal adjustment set, there is a unique minimal adjustment set, which turns out to be the optimal among minimal adjustment sets. Um, and how do I find that minimal optimal adjustment set? What I do is I, essentially consider the optimal adjustment set, okay, the Z of, in this, the Z adjustment set, the optimal Z adjustment set, and I start removing variables from that set, except for the Zs that I keep, I start removing variables that are not associated with A, okay, conditional on the remaining variables. And it turns out that you can do this process until you, you exhaust, okay, and there's always a smallest subset of O union Z uh, that includes Z and that, um, that, um, that satisfies this condition. Okay, so um, now uh, in uh, our 2020 paper, we show that when Z is the empty set, O min is the optimal minimal adjustment set. And in our 2021, we show that it's the minimal. Now, here is the deal. This is the optimal a uh, minimal adjustment set that is static because I can remove contact sport. Contact sport is, um, is conditionally independent of treatment given what remains, but I cannot remove anything else because anything else will, uh, uh, will, be, um, will, will uh, destroy, um, destroy the, um, uh, the, the validity of the adjustment set. Yet if I wanted to consider uh, an, op an adjustment set that it depends on previous injury, where Z is previous injury, now I have to include contact sport. So if, if I don't include contact sport, then I create a, an open path, okay? So now the optimal minimal adjustment set agrees with the optimal global adjustment set. I cannot remove any variable uh, in this case. Okay, now 
I'm going to skip all the minimum stuff because uh, there's no no time really for for minimum. Let me just very briefly say a few words about uh, hidden variables, DAX with hidden variables. So if I have DAX with hidden variables, uh, even if uh, an observable variable adjustment set exists, uh, a globally optimal adjustment set may not exist. And this was actually also noticed in the paper by Henkel et al. And, uh, and here is an example. Uh, if I have this DAG and U uh, is not observable, then I have two options. Either the empty set is an adjustment set or L1, L2 is an adjustment set. And neither one is uh, a winner uh, universally because it will depend on whether L1, L2 are great predictors of Y where, while not good predictors of A, in which case L1, L2 will be, you know, under those laws where, you know, the association encoded in the blue line is weak, uh, but the association encoded in the red lines, um, red arrows is strong, then L1, L2 will be a winner, but otherwise, um, you know, if the reverse strength uh, occur, the empty set will be a winner. Um, so uh, in uh, our paper, 21, 2021 paper, in fact, we did show that there, we did prove a sufficient condition uh, for existence of a globally optimal adjust adjustment set. And this is, of course, that there is an adjustment set. And secondly, that, uh, that every observable and just uh, variable is an ancestor of at least A, Y, or Z. And again, I don't have time to go through much of this. Uh, we also proved in that paper that optimal minimal and optimal minimum always exist among the observable minimum and minimal adjusted uh, Z adjustment sets, so long as, of course, there is one adjustment set that is observable. And we provided the polynomial time graphical algorithm that is based on a particular latent projected undirected moralized graph uh, that finds actually the optimal minimal and minimum and the globally optimal when uh, that such uh, when the you know when the conditions that I previously previously stated the sufficient conditions hold. And we wrote a Python package you know uh, that is available uh, that implements these algorithms. So I'm not sure how much I, I won't talk about say parametric estimation, I don't have time for that, but let me just mention a few things that I didn't talk about at all. Uh, multiple treatment and time dependent confounding, the results are not so exciting because uh, there are graphs which uh, not even a globally optimal uh, adjustment set exists um, when, um, when every, all the variables are observable. Uh, so I'm not, uh, it's, it's subtle, but it's like that. I didn't talk at all about uh, CPDAX and PDAX, even though many of the results that we, we did apply also, of, that we have apply also to, to these DAX. There's a lot of work in this area uh, by Emma and, and co-authors, um, um, Vanessa, uh, Witt, et cetera. And uh, they are all fantastic. They are mostly, mostly, except by the, for the week, week, week at all, are focused on, on linear models, on linear gra graphical models. But let me just mention a, a, an open question that, um, that um, you know, several open questions that we're working some on, on right now, for some of which we have some answers, some we don't, okay? So really, really for design, the question of interest is the following. So assume the cost of an adjustment set is CL, okay? So you have a cost for each adjustment set. So now we want to find the adjustment set that minimizes, okay, the asymptotic variance overall adjustment set that satisfy the cost constraint, okay? A cost constraint where you have C star is the, the total amount of money that you're willing to spend, that you can spend. And that is, uh, you know, that it's true um, universally for all laws uh, in the Bayesian network. We don't think this problem is solvable. We don't even know that there is a solution, but perhaps what we think we will be able to find a solution is, uh, it would restrict attention to the C star that is already uh, looking at only, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the minimum cost. It's the cost of the, the less costly uh, adjustment set. And of course, this is what uh, minimum, the L minimum solves because it solves it when the cost is the size of the adjustment set. Um, so then there is semi-parametric efficiency index with hidden variables. There is some progress in this paper, although there's a lot of uh, things that aren't resolved yet. Uh, 
And there's other estimates, and we are working with ATT. There's even questions of how to define what we mean by an adjustment set in these cases. We no longer use the Q formula, but what exactly do we mean? And we have some results on ATT that we're working with Ezekiel, and, uh, and I'll stop here. Sorry if I went too long. Okay. Thanks, Andrea, uh, for the great talk. Uh, we'll now move over to uh, the discussion with Emma. So, so Emma. I think uh, I will stop sharing, right? Yeah. And then yeah, okay. you can when you're ready. Yeah, sure. Let me, you will need to let me know if you see my slides. Do you see them? Yes, or no? that's great. Yeah. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Okay, so uh, first, I just want to say thank you to the organizers of the seminar. It's always a nice seminar. Um, and I, I would like to thank Andrea for kind of inviting me to serve as a discussant here. Uh, so I have as you may have noticed from Andreas talk, done some work on covariate adjustments. So I think that's kind of my uh, reason for being here, but hopefully I can shed a slightly different perspective on these results, given that I uh, tend to work with graphical models a lot and that's, that's the perspective that I usually take. So first uh, I'll just do a little overview on covariate adjustment and how we got to this point. So uh, covariate adjustment is a, a kind of a commonly used tool to identify total causal effects. In its first and maybe most famous iteration, it was known as the backdoor adjustment introduced by Pearl in 1993. And so a valid uh, covariate adjustment set can then be used to construct estimators of the total causal effects through these outcome regressions or these uh, inverse probability weighted estimators or some doubly robust estimators as Andrea pointed out. And so recent uh, kind of advances, I guess, in causal inference have allowed us to enumerate all valid covariate adjustment sets for a pair of treatment response variables A, Y, given a particular graphical model. So Andrea has listed this paper by Juan Gersander that's uh, really kind of the starting point of, of all of this work. Uh, right, so here, uh, if you have this causal graphical model that you define in the form of a DAG, as Andrea mentioned, uh, usually you have more than one valid covariate adjustment set if there is a valid covariate adjustment set that you could use to kind of uh, estimate the total causal effect. So that leads to a natural question, if I have more than one, like which one of these adjustment sets would lead us to the most efficient estimator? And uh, in this paper by Henkel et al., so uh, Leonard Henkel and Malus Mathaus, who are both at ETH Zurich, and are soon moving to Copenhagen, actually, also congrats. Uh, so we explore this question in terms of a linear structural causal model, and given this uh, outcome regression, and given uh, DAG, CPDAG, or MPDAG. So these DAG, CPDAG, and MPDAGs are graphical models that we consider. So in Andrea's talk, uh, she focused on, on the DAG case, but I'm going to try to give this perspective of uh, CPDAG or MPDAG in this case. So <clears throat> what are these graphs? So, so the perspective that we take in this Henkel et al. paper is that we are trying to learn or we, we are learning a graph from observational data and perhaps some background knowledge from experts. And to do this, we're exploiting some conditional independencies in the data. Now, without making additional assumption, uh, the graph that you can learn from this uh, type of observational data, and perhaps some expert knowledge, is a CPDAG or an MPDAG. Uh, meaning these are kind of summary graphs that represent an equivalence class of DAGs. And one of these DAGs is your causal truth, but we do not know which one of them is the true one. So if you, for example, have data generated by a linear structural causal model with Gaussian noise, then you could, uh, if you have enough data, learn uh, the CP DAG representation of this graph. Okay. So the question that we had is, if you have this kind of equivalence class of graphs, uh, when can you find the most efficient adjustment sets that can estimate your total causal effect. So if you have an equivalence class of graphs, graphs, you first need to think about when is your causal effect in fact identifiable, meaning it will not always be identifiable. It will not always be the same for all the graphs in your equivalence class. But actually, if it is identifiable and uh, in particular non-zero, we actually know that uh, whenever it is identifiable in this equivalence class represented by CPDAG or MPDAG, it can actually also be identified through covariate adjustment. So Andrea mentioned a little bit that in some cases you cannot estimate the total effect using covariate adjustment uh, or this particular covariate adjustment that we assume, uh, which is true, but it turns out when you have kind of single variables, AY and a non-zero causal effect, 
and you have the CPDAG and MPDAG where the causal effect design is viable, you can use covariate adjustment to estimate it. And so we use this uh, kind of setup and then found this or uh, Leo showed this efficiency based pruning and supplementing of variables uh, to adjustment sets. And so we also use that to define this uh, as Andrea refers to it globally optimal adjustment set. However, our results uh, also additionally assume these linear structural models and uh, so greatly depend on that. But I just wanted to point out here that pers the perspective we're taking is that the efficient, we're looking for kind of an efficient estimator using a graph that can be learned from observational data and uh, under identifiability of causal effect. And this leads us to use essentially these conditional independence constraints as, uh, as constraints that kind of from which we derive our results. So uh, Andrea, in these two papers uh, with Ezekiel and Facundo, who is here, uh, they expanded on these results quite a bit, but they focused on this DAG setting. So what they look at is they look at kind of the semi-parametric efficiency uh, that can be achieved with this uh, adjustment sets and try to find the best adjustment sets in terms of the semi-parametric efficiency. So they actually show that the same type of pruning and supplementation of variables can be applied in this setting and that they also derive the same globally optimal adjustment set here. So the perspective taken in this paper is right, they're assuming a DAG, but they're looking for semi-parametric efficient estimators and that leads uh, them to use conditional independence constraints to derive this efficient estimator. So there's kind of two different ways of getting to the same point, right? Either you look at kind of equivalence classes and therefore you use conditional independencies or you look at semi-parametric efficient estimators and that therefore you use conditional independencies um, and they all kind of lead you to the same uh, more or less result. So of course these two papers further expand the concepts of adjustment sets. So Andrea mentioned the globally optimal, the optimal minimal and optimal minimum adjustment sets but they kind of further contract, contrast the standard definition that I'm used to seeing of an adjustment set with some other kind of settings. So in particular, uh, this static adjustment set is kind of the standard definition of an adjustment set as I'm used to seeing it, but they contrast it with this dynamic adjustment set, which is uh, an adjustment set that kind of depends on some non-descendants of your treatment where the treatment is assigned based on the certain values of these non-descendants. And they actually have this proposition that the uh, something is a dynamic adjustment set if, if it is also a static adjustment set uh, in your graph. So because my work is mostly on these equivalence classes, my commentary uh, will revolve around when can you extend these results to these equivalence classes? And I think this proposition is an example of a result that actually immediately extends to kind of equivalence classes of graphs. Uh, and I think that stems from the fact that we're both uh, using kind of conditional independencies for all of these cases. So they also list the criteria for identifying these minimums that uh, Z dynamic adjustment sets. And I believe I may have, they also contain all other Z dynamic adjustment sets uh, not just the minimum ones, via node cuts in an undirected graph. And so to do this, they generalize a result from Van der Sander et al. So I would guess based on those results extending to CP CPDAX and MPDAX that this as well, this kind of node cuts uh, rule should also extend. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now in the other paper, so Ken Smokler, they contrast the static adjustment sets. So now they're referred to as the time independent adjustment sets is the same definition as I had in the previous slides. But that this contrast is with these time dependent adjustment sets. So, um, and apologies, I've switched from using uh, L for an adjustment set to now using Z. So this is just from the paper. Uh, so this time dependent adjustment set, so in the case where you may have uh, sequential treatments, in terms of time. So you have one treatment that influences perhaps the next sequence of treatments. Uh, you will not always have a static adjustment set or this time independent adjustment sets, even if you know the causal back. So they define this time dependent covariate adjustment set as this uh, kind of sequence of uh, adjustment uh, sets or this, this adjustment set consists of many of these kind of intermediate adjustment sets. 
So this criterion, I believe, is uh, in Pearl's book referred to as sequential backdoor. Um, you could also refer to it as a G-functional. Uh, and there's some, it kind of appears throughout some other uh, papers. But they showed that essentially a similar type of pruning and supplementation of variables for efficiency can be applied to these time-dependent covariate adjustment sets. Now, it's not exactly one-to-one. -one, it's a bit more complicated because these sets are more complicated, but a similar type of pruning can apply. Now, I think uh, that result should kind of, again, generalize to the CPDEG and MPDEG case. But an interesting kind of uh, open question here is how you would kind of identify what is this time-dependent covariate adjustment set and what, what are all the valid covariate adjustment, these time-dependent covariate adjustment sets given an equivalence class. So that's, I think, unsolved and kind of very interesting. Mm -hmm. All right, just uh, some more kind of general questions that this paper opens up. So uh, Rodnitke and Smukler further derived conditions under which this optimal adjustment set would be also semi-parametrically optimal. So also optimal among kind of all other ways of estimating the total effect. But it is not always semi-parametrically optimal. So in particular, for example, in this graph where you have A to some mediator M to Y, we know that uh, an empty adjustment set is a valid adjustment and the optimal adjustment set here. But we know that we can get kind of a better estimate if we exploit the fact that there is this mediator here. So in the linear setting, you can consider kind of uh, make computing this effect as a product of these two effects. So one from A to M and M to Y. And in uh, an earlier paper, uh, so Richard Guo and I showed that in this setting, this linear setting, uh, that would be uh, more efficient than we, we, of course that result is known for, for a while. We generalized it to kind of the CPDAG and MPDAG case. <clears throat> There's further kind of uh, constraints that you can use that, uh, that adjustments that do not use. So for example, uh, even if you don't have this mediator, you may have this case where uh, O1 and O2 would be the optimal adjustment set for this A and Y, but using just an adjustment set here to estimate A and Y does not exploit this independency between these O1 and O2. So here, this would be an optimal set. The question is kind of, how do you optimally estimate the causal effect in general? And uh, furthermore, we've seen that there's problems when you add latent variables. Um, so the question is also kind of what do you do then? And I think Andrea mentioned a bit that in that case, you can still use these minimal adjustment sets, but perhaps there's something something better we can do in that case too. All right, so those were, those were my comments. I hope I didn't take too much time. Uh, thank you again for letting me discuss this, uh, these nice works. Um, thank you, Emma. And Andrea, would you like to briefly respond? No, I'm... Uh... Do I have, like, yeah, can you hear me, right? Uh, yes. No, so thank you very much, Emma, for uh, the uh, discussion. Uh, a couple of points. The first one is um, I have a problem um, uh, about um, looking for optimal adjustment sets in CPDACs and DACs, because when I think of those, I think that there has been a process of model selection early on. And so I'm not sure how to think about the inference when I arrive at this CPDAG, I have no problem if I start from that CPDAG. The problem is I arrive to that CPDAG after a process of already model selection. And that was part of the reason why we put off with that. And we said, this is the other area, this is the other scenario where we feel that, you know, I wouldn't have a CPDAG to start with, you know, if I am designing a study because I, I haven't seen data yet. Okay, so that's why, you know, we, we moved into that direction. And um, not to say that, you know, the results are fantastic, you know, the results that Emma and Richard and, and Vanessa have, but, but I'm saying I, I have a little bit of a problem there. Uh, and then the other thing is, um, is that, um, about semi-parametric efficiency, I said nothing. I mean, there, we have a lot of results in that 2020 paper, particularly about we have a complete and sound algorithm to determine when uh, you don't really need to measure all the other variables because just the optimal adjustment set and using non-parametrically adjusted estimation is going to attain the semi-parametric efficiency bound uh, uh, in a model that actually exploits all the assumptions in the, in the graph. So we actually characterize the graphs where you don't have to worry about anything else. And if you, don't, if you do have to worry about something else, and a super interesting question from the design point of view is, okay, 
suppose that I give you a graph. Now, find of the graph the variables that really show up in the efficient score. All the other variables don't matter. Okay, so if you're going to focus on estimation, just bother to, to estimate to measure only those variables. And we're actually working and have super exciting results with Emma and Richard, and particularly the problem. Okay, so we didn't mention anything about that. There's no time. Maybe next year you invite us and we'll tell you all we learned about that problem. Uh, but, but that's about it. Okay, so. Thanks, Andrea. Um, so okay. maybe it's time to, uh, to wrap up. So, um, <clears throat> so let me share my screen. So uh, thanks, Andrea and Emma, for a, a great talk. Uh, next week, we're going to have uh, Alberto Abadi from MIT uh, talk about a penalized synthetic control estimator for disaggregated data. Uh, we're looking forward to that talk, and we hope you will join us. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Good talk. And great discussion.